I first became aware of Flipper in the summer of 1992, which was only a few months after I'd taken over as chief executive of Whisper. Flipper, I was told, was a 10-year-old bottlenose dolphin um, that had been in captivity in a town called Santos in central Brazil for about nine years. The dolphin was named Flipper by the people who were showing it in the dolphin area, simply because Flipper was such a well-known name. Flipper had been taken from his mother when he was less than a year old from a site called Laguna, about 200 miles south of Santos, and he'd been performing dolphin in a dolphin area. The Brazilian government, a few years back, had made the showing of captive marine mammals for exhibition illegal. The showground had closed down, and the owner, who lived there with his family, had retained Flipper as the one remaining um, animal in his collection. He fed him every day with live fish, but he did nothing else. The tank that Flipper lived in was about mm, 20 feet in diameter, and over the years, uh, because of uh, disuse and lack of uh, proper cleansing had become pretty putrid. I saw Flipper about two months after that in the autumn of 1992 where it was difficult to see him in the water unless he came to the surface. Seeing that magnificent animal spending most of its time swimming and floating in its own feces uh, really made me think that something had to be done and I promised that dolphin then and myself that I would get him out of that tank. It wasn't as easy as that might sound. You can't just take a dolphin and put it back in the sea. It would die almost straight away. To that animal, uh, food was something that came out of the sky uh, from his keepers who threw fish, dead fish, from buckets uh, into his pool. I looked around for the best dolphin trainer that I could find and found an American called Richard O'Barry, or Rick as he's known. Rick was the sort of person that lived on the site. I mean, he would literally string a hammock between two trees beside the pool that the dolphin was in. And Rick's job was to teach that dolphin how to live again in the sea, how to catch live fish as opposed to wait to have dead ones thrown to him. And Rick worked with the dolphin for about a month trying to get it back to health. Uh, we had various veterinarians fly down, um, give the dolphin treatment, and it started to show signs of health again. So at a certain time, when it was ready to be moved, we airlifted Flipper by helicopter and moved him several hundred miles back to the exact site where he'd been taken nine years before. It had a very high media profile. The whole country got behind it. It was a wonderful thing. It was in the captivity about the same amount of time that Keiko, the famous whale from the Free Willy movie, has been in captivity, very similar situation, in isolation in a small substandard tank. We took Flipper out of the tank and placed him in the natural sea enclosure. That's where the healing process really begins, not in another tank, in natural sea water, where they can experience the tide and the current and the natural rhythms of the sea. All of those things have healing properties. So Flipper was flown there in a tank, makeshift tank that we'd put together on the beach at Santos, and put back into the sea, first time he'd been in the sea for nine years. Over the next three months, Rick and our team worked with the dolphin every day, teaching him how to catch fish again by throwing live fish to him. We also found his sauna came back. He started to use it again. He became amazingly perky. He would leap out of the water, play with Rick on regular occasions. And over about a three month period, his strength and his health came back to him. And it came to the point around about March 1993 when Flipper was ready to go. The mayor turned out, so television crews were there, hundreds of people turned up, including many of the fishermen who remembered when he was captured. The fence was cut and Rick and Flipper very slowly swam through the fence into the open sea. For 30 minutes, Flipper wouldn't leave Rick's side. The bonding between the two had been so strong that although he knew, and dolphins are very intelligent animals, he knew that he was free, and in fact could see other wild dolphins, probably dolphins from his previous pod that he'd, he'd lived with, swimming nearby. But for about 30 minutes, he stayed with Rick, swam away from him, came back again, and then suddenly, almost as a, a sort of thank you, I'm, I'm off, he leapt into the air, straight out of the water, did an amazing leap, and then was off. 
The last recorded sighting of Flipper was exactly two years after he was released. That was in March 1995. And an amateur photographer spotted him with other dolphins, uh, filmed him, and uh, we, we saw it on film. The project cost us something like $60,000 in total, and we did get the odd criticism that this is a lot of money to spend on, on one dolphin. I have two answers to that. One, the money was raised from animal lovers who knew where it was going to be spent. We made many appeals to the public to save this dolphin. So every penny that was spent on releasing Flipper came from people who wanted the money to be spent to save that animal. Secondly, I regarded it as, as a bit of a symbol. The captivity industry, those people who make a living capturing and showing wild animals uh, for entertainment, quite often maintain that it's not possible to return a captive animal to the wild. This quite clearly is rubbish. We have done it, it can be done, and in most cases it's again an attempt by them to try and preserve an industry that has no real reason to be in existence. They're self-aware creatures that routinely make choices and decisions regarding the details of their life. They're entitled to freedom of choice, thus they are entitled to freedom. Capturing them and dragging them, kicking and screaming into these dolphinariums is, is simply wrong.